Today, inshallah, let's do one of our um, atypical talks, inshallah, a little bit about uh, Islam and science and also one of the most interesting stories in our history and also a little bit about the decline of science. A lot of various topics coming together. And the persona I chose to, inshallah, illustrate some of these lessons is one of the greatest scientists, not only in our tradition, but in fact, in all of human history. So much so that in fact, most modern researchers say that this particular person is the father of modern science. And he is somebody by the name of Ibn al-Haytham. Ibn al-Haytham. Now our story is not going to be just about him, it's going to be broader than him, but we have to begin with him so that we understand what we're talking about. Ibn al-Haytham was born around 960 CE in Basra. Uh, his name is al-Hassan ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Haytham. And so al-Hassan ibn al-Hassan, the West called him al-Hazin. Al-Hazin. They called him Al-Hazin. So in the West, they called him Al-Hazin. And he grew up in Basra. And from a young age, he started studying the sciences, in particular physics and optics. And he started writing. He wrote over 250 books. I mean, this is a polymath. And he rose in fame. Now, there's an interesting uh, story here. And it is said that one of the reasons why he chose to study science instead of religious studies, which was the more common at the time, was that in the Abbasid Caliphate at the time, at the end of the 10th century, there was a lot of sectarianism going on, which is very true. So a little bit of footnote here. The Vizier dynasty was the Buwayhid or the Buyid dynasty. And this is a dynasty that is not Sunni in nature. They are Ithna Ashari. And the Abbasid Khal Caliphate was very hardcore Sunni. And their main rival was actually the Fatimids in Egypt, which was Ismaili. So there was a lot of sectarianism warfare going on between the Sunnis, the Ithna Asharis, the Seveners, Ismailis. And so it is said that this particular person became disillusioned with religious studies. He went to another discipline, and that is sciences. So he kept on rising, and he wrote, wrote treatises. One of the uh, things he began to say at the time the Fatimid Empire was at its pinnacle, and the Nile had flood. And hundreds of people had died. It was one of the worst floods in, in, in recent history in the last century. And so Ibn al-Haytham remarked, if I had power, I could stop the flooding of the Nile. And he perhaps wrote a treatise, we're not sure exactly how, about how to build a dam to stop the overflowing of the Nile. The Fatimid Caliphate heard of this. And his name was Al-Hakim bi Amrillah. And so he sent him a job offer. Come and work for me. I'll pay you a fortune. You're going to be my engineer. Come over to my side. Leave the Abbasid side. Come over to my side. And so he accepted. It was a very lucrative job offer. He accepted the job offer. He moved from Basra all the way to Cairo, to uh, Fatimid, Egypt. And he traveled to Aswan. Aswan Dam. There's a dam right now. He traveled to Aswan. And he realized he had never seen the Nile before. And the dam could not be built. There was too much water, the width of the river, the velocity. He realized it could not be built. But there was now one problem. What is the problem? Hmm? Al-Hakim bi Amrillah. Wa ma adrakam al-Hakim bi Amrillah. The Arabs, some of them know, especially the Egyptians. For those of you who are not familiar with Al-Hakim bi Amrillah, let me begin our first tangent. And this is intentional, okay? One of the most bizarre leaders ever to rule over segments of the Muslim world is this particular persona. He is actually called the Mad King, the Mad Caliph. He's called the Mad Khalifa. And Al-Hakim bi Amrillah, of course, he's a Fatimid. So this means he is from the Ismaili branch because the Fatimids were Ismaili. Al-Hakim bi Amrillah, we don't know. Was there a screw loose? Was he just... Whatever? We don't know. He was very bizarre. He ruled for almost, what, 27 years? And his whole reign was full of one strange hukum after another. For example, he decided for whatever reason, all the sukhs will be shut during the day. They're going to be open during the night. So for a period of time, the whole night, the sukhs had lights and the daytime was shut. Another year, he decided some dog must have barked at night. All the dogs of Cairo are going to be executed. So all of the dogs were killed, right? For some reason, he didn't like uh, women for some reason. So he said, no women's going to leave their house for a particular period of time. Women were still leaving. So he told the, uh, the shoemakers, stop making shoes of women. Because women cannot go without shoes. So all the shoe shops, that's a big fitna for the women. All the shoe shops shut down. 
and so women didn't have shoes and so they could on and on some bizarre rulings and he was bloodthirsty he would kill anybody for any reason he did the most bizarre things now of course ibn al-haytham now he is in trouble because he took the offer thinking he can do it get the money get rich and go back now when he realized he cannot do it he is in serious trouble so what did he do he pretended to go mad started blabbering started going crazy so he pretended he pretended to be senile he pretended to go crazy and so he was brought in front of al-hakim blabbering whatnot and the doctors assumed that he's crazy so al-hakim said okay imprison him for life otherwise he will be executed because he pretended to be crazy al-hakim said imprison him for life throw him in the dungeons of cairo subhanallah in the dungeons of cairo one of the greatest methodological changes occurred to which modern Western scientists say this is the birth of modern science in the dungeons of Cairo. Again, all of these quirks of history, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings everything together and amazing things happen. What happened in the dungeons of Cairo? He was shut there, not for one, two, three, ten years. But instead of going crazy, he was doing research. How can you do research in the dungeon? What are you going to do research on? What happened was, one day he was in pitch darkness. So it was like, you know, solitary confinement, no light, anything like this. And one day from a crack in the wall, small hole in the wall, it was a very tiny hole. It was supposed to be complete dark. He saw this hole come and give a complete image on the side of the cell, but upside down. The image was upside down. And this began to intrigue him. What's going on here? And slowly but surely, he began researching optics and light and the theory of light rays in jail. And he began writing. Eventually, Al-Hakim dies. He's released. And he writes, he wrote over 250 books. One of his largest is a seven-volume book. Seven volumes called Kitab al manavir the book of Nadar, the book of light and optics, the book of Manavir. Seven volumes. And in this book, he began the theory of light. Now, you should be aware that before, before Ibn al-Haytham, Euclid and other ancient Greek uh, um, uh, physicists, they had a bizarre theory. They thought our eyes give rays. They thought our eyes give rays. And those rays can see. And then we are seeing what the eyes emit. They had a bizarre theory. Ibn al-Haytham said this cannot be the case because the image is upside down. Because of that dot, because of that hole, the image is upside down. So therefore, the rays are not coming from the eyes. They're coming from where? The object. The object is sending rays to my eyes. And the rays travel and that hole, the, that aperture reverses. The top goes down and the bottom goes up. Go back to your grade 7 physics, the same diagram. Ibn al-Haytham was the first to draw that diagram that you now have in your grade 7 textbooks of science. Ibn al-Haytham. He literally has diagrams like this. The top goes through here, the bottom goes through there, and the image is reversed around. And he began what is called the techniques of modern science. How so? He writes in his uh, uh, Kitab al-Manadir that one of the biggest problems of people is they trust previous scholarship too much and they consider anything written by people before them to be valid so we need to begin by doubt by skepticism we need to begin by not trusting what people in the past have said and bringing a theory and then testing to see if that theory is valid this is the beginning of modern science right you posit a theory and then you bring tests. And so after he was released from jail, he did so many tests turned into the seven volumes of these tests that he did is to demonstrate that in fact light does come or rays are reflected from the object. They are reversed around. He did research in optics. He was the first to invent the camera box, right? So uh, he wrote a, a, a treatise that was translated. We're going to get to this. And this treatise paved the way for our theories of optics, 
for telescopes, for cameras. So some say Ibn al-Haytham invented the camera. This is a bit of an exaggeration. He didn't invent the camera, but he invented the technology that is used for the camera. This is Ibn al-Haytham. And so his book became extremely popular. As we said, uh, it is called Kitab al-Manadir. And so in his own lifetime, he became a living legend. He passed away in Cairo in 1040 CE or so. Now, once his book spread across the Muslim world, there were three Khulafa at this time. There's the Khalifa in Baghdad, there's the Khalifa in Egypt, and then there was the third Khalifa, Andalus. There's three Khalifas at that time. Each one wanted his writings. So the Khalifa of Andalus orders his entire writings, right? So they are brought to Andalus within a few decades. And in Andalus, again, this is Allah's Qadr, all of this is happening at the same time. In Andalus, the reconquista has begun, the, the, the conquering of uh, Muslims, uh, Spain. But it is still 1000, 1100. So Granada is going to be protected for another 500 years. What was the first city to fall? The first city to fall in 1084 was Tulaytila, Toledo. The first city to fall was Toledo. And the rest of Spain was Muslim. So what happened here was that Toledo then became the one place in the whole world where Muslims and Christians lived side by side, no animosity. The Muslims were not expelled from Toledo. Why were they not expelled? Because all of Andalus is Muslim. They're not, there's no war right now. It's just the Christians have conquered and the Muslims can live in Toledo. This is 1080, 1100, 1150. So in Toledo, what happens? the translation movement begins. And what is this translation movement? From Arabic into? No, into Latin. From Arabic into Latin. This movement was to change Europe forever. It translated all of the classical books that the Muslims use for their sciences. By the way, they also translated the Quran. The first time the Quran was translated into European language, in Toledo, in 10 or 11, 1180, 1180 by Robert of Ketten from England. Robert of Ketten. Robert of Ketten, I think I mentioned his story if I haven't. He came from England to study medicine in Andalusia. Once upon a time, Europeans came to Muslim lands to become doctors. These days, we come here to study, right? Once upon a time, people would come to Muslim lands to become doctors. So Robert of Ketten, Ketten is a place in England, small village. He traveled to Andalusia to become a doctor. But the Pope requested him, forget being a doctor, become our translator. He started translating the Quran, many books. Of the books that were translated in Toledo was Kitab, which Kitab? Kitab al manadir of Ibn al-Haytham. One of the first books to be translated. And this sparked an entire, if you like, generation of thinkers in Europe, including um, Roger Bacon and including Galileo, and including, what's the guy who did the stars? I forgot his name. I forgot his name, it'll come to me. All of these, even, even um, um, no, even uh, the Italian guy, Da Vinci. Da Vinci, some of his diagrams, you've all seen Da Vinci's diagrams. They're famous, right? Some of his diagrams are copy-paste from Kitab al manadir right? So Da Vinci and Galileo, and Bacon, and all of these guys are actually reading Kitab al manadir And that's why Al-Hazin, his name, Ibn al-Haytham, Al-Hazin, Al-Hassan, they called him Al-Hazin. Al-Hazin became a household name in all of Europe. Unfortunately, many of us don't know him. But in the 13th, 14th, 15th century, he was considered one of the greatest scholars of the world. So much so, the first book written in English, the first book of poetry written in English. Who can tell me what that was? I'm quizzing you guys, totally different topic. The first book written in English. You should know this. The first book written in English, the first book of poetry, the first book of literature, written in what we call English, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, right? Uh, Canterbury Tales. The Canterbury Tales mentions Al-Hazin by name as one of the greatest scholars of the time. Now, all of this to conclude on this point. What happened to us? Like, why did we go from being the leaders of technology, from the leaders of optics, this book literally influenced the entire European concept of optics, of rays. Galileo couldn't have done what he did without having read Kitab al-Manadir. It was the basis and then he built on it. So what happened? 
to our civilization. Why did we decline? This topic cannot be answered in a simple khatira, but I'll tell you five predominant theories, five simplistic solutions. The first of them, which is the most popular a hundred years ago, this was the common one in this part of the world, in Western, in Western world, they would say the reason why the Muslim world declined intellectually was because of the ulama. And in particular, they blamed one person, Al Ghazali. And there was this theory back in the 40s, especially 50s, was very common that Al Ghazali, Hujjat al Islam, was single handedly responsible for the decline of the Ummah. Okay? Yani, why would they say this? A long story, but simplistically, they said Al Ghazali, his stance against the philosophers and Ibn Sina, and his claim that Ibn Sina's committing kufr and whatnot, this is the cause of the decline of the ummah. So, point number one, they said, or the first theory, the scholars of Islam, the ulama, shut down science and intellectual thought. Now, to gently respond to this, or to harshly respond to this, you are giving way too much credit to the scholars. The scholars might have said whatever they did, it didn't impact the research of the scientists. There was never a pope or a sheikh al islam that burnt somebody on the stake that happened in europe there was never a trial of galileo and said oh this is kufr you're going to be killed because you say chemistry physics math no it is true ghazali and ibn taymiyyah and everybody that's cleric said ibn sina is outside the fold of islam this is a factual truth and by the way this is not the time to go there but this is a very awkward topic that we need to actually be frank about many of our scholars did not like many of our scientists. That's also a factual statement. And as you know me, I don't sugarcoat. And as you know me, I don't romanticize the past because there's no point in doing that. Fact of the matter, there was tension. And it is almost impossible to find an alim of the religion who was also a scientist. But by the way, the reason also is that you can't specialize. I can't specialize in medicine and in Islamic studies. I can't specialize in PhD in optical physics and in tafsir and sirah. You own one life, right? But fact of the matter is there was also tension. And a lot of our scholars did not like the theological, but that's the key point. They didn't care about, you know, the discoveries of medicine and whatnot. They didn't like some of the theological positions of many of the scientists. Not all of the scientists, many of them. So this is the first theory. The second theory, what is the decline of the ummah, is done by most of us practicing Muslims. Who do we blame? Who do we blame? Who do we like to blame? The West. How do we blame the West? What one particular issue? Colonialism. So this is a second theory. That the cause of the decline is not us, it's you guys. You guys came in invaded. You guys took over. You guys colonized 90% of the Muslim world. You guys created 55 nation states. All of this is correct, but there's one problem. Our decline began far before colonization, factually speaking. So this is a simplistic throwing away, but it doesn't the, the buck's still with us, okay? So that's the second theory. The third theory is that the level of confidence that the ummah had when it reached its pinnacle lulled them into a sense of superiority. We don't need to do any more research now. We don't need to be cutting edge. Once they became a global empire, they felt a level of confidence where this curiosity, this inquisitiveness just went on the decline. Now the problem with this theory is difficult to prove. It's a theory, how do you prove this? But it's there. The fourth theory is that the main cause of decline is the Mongol invasion. The Mongol invasion, the sack of Baghdad in the 1250s when, the, when, when Hulaku Khan came, Cengiz Khan came before him and then Hulaku Khan came. The invasion of the Mongols destroyed the Abbasid Caliphate, right? Dispersed, hundreds of libraries were, were destroyed, millions of books and tens of millions of people. So the Mongol invasion is single-handedly said this was the biggest catastrophe that stopped the Ummah in its tracks. Now, this theory actually does have a little bit of sense because we really see a sharp divide pre-Mongol and post-Mongol invasion. We really do see this, right? So actually this theory might have some, some legitimacy to it, okay? And then the fifth and final theory is that it's not so much that the Ummah declined, it's that the West caught up and then superseded. It's not the Ummah went down, it's the 
Renaissance took place, the Reformation took place. Europe overthrew the shackles of the Dark Ages via the catalyst of the Muslim Empire, no doubt, via the catalyst of the translation movements. And then Europe continued to rise, rise, rise. And the ascent then overtook the Muslim Empire. Now, this, all of these theories, and there's more. In my humble opinion, there is no single cause that we can unilaterally say, oh, this is the reality. And perhaps, perhaps all of these five and more have a role to play in this regard. In the end of the day though, we do need to move beyond romanticizing the past. We do need to move beyond, oh, we had Ibn Sina and we had Ibn al-Haytham. Okay, what do we have now, right? It's good to take courage from the past to learn that indeed once upon a time we had all of this. But in my humble opinion, we need to move beyond just talking about the past in order to feel good about today. We need to start thinking civilizationally. What can we do to revive the ummah politically, economically? What can we do to preserve our identity beyond just what we are doing currently now? And these are questions that I don't have the answers to because it's beyond my speciality. But every one of us needs to think, why was the ummah so different a thousand years ago when actually the world was a very different place? We actually were in charge now with technology and with all of this, we should be at the cutting edge. You would think it's easier to do more productive things. So inshallah with this, I conclude with a simple plea to all of us to not just think about the past and romanticize, but to ask ourselves, what can we do to revive that spirit of civilization, that spirit of izza that is beyond just the one aspect of religion. It goes to science and to technology and to medicine. Once upon a time, and I know it sounds romantic past, but it is true. We did have the greatest civilization, the strongest currency, the most beautiful libraries, the best scientists of every field. What happened? I don't have an easy answer, but our religion is not the cause of our decline because our religion was the one in charge and we still had all of this izza. So what is that cause? I don't know, but every one of us should try to think about how we can preserve and keep the legacy alive. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he blesses us all to be in mafatih al-khayri maghali qashar. Inshallah, we'll continue next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما